Last week we kicked off a brand new study, a brand new series. I've simply entitled it uh, Heaven on Earth. And uh, we are, for the next several weeks, going to walk through uh, the first part of this incredible uh, section of Scripture where Jesus, in His inaugural message, challenges His followers and, and all those who are listening uh, to follow Him in such a way that their lives would experience literally heaven on earth. It's, it's a, a passage that you've probably heard before that we looked at last week and we'll look at uh, another one today. It's a, a section of Scripture that you're probably somewhat familiar with, but it has the potential to forever change your life. Last week we talked about uh, kind of the, the character of those who are part of the kingdom, those who live for God, those who experience uh, heaven on earth. Jesus would say that you live a blessed life. And when we looked at that last week, we defined blessing uh, not in the terms of simply uh, getting lots of stuff, but more in the character of our heart and the presence of God with us. Along comes joy, and it fills us up, and it, and it, and it kind of uh, builds us up too, not just fills us up, but builds us up to live for Him. We looked last week at kind of the character of those who are part of the, the kingdom of God. Uh, today, Jesus goes a, another direction, and he really looks at the conduct. Those who are a part of the kingdom, if they experience his presence, then in relation to that, they live for him in a certain way. And so the byproduct of that, as, as I would define it, would be sort of a divine influence. A divine influence. You know, some who are in the business world have, have worked real hard through the years to define leadership. And the simplest way to define leadership is this. Leadership is influence. Leadership is influence. And I get the sense of what Jesus is saying here is that he wants us to be leaders in the kingdom, but also leaders in our world, that he wants our influence to permeate the culture around us so that the things of God would begin to be represented right here on planet earth. And that, that is heaven on earth. Can you say amen? Are you with me this morning? Last week we looked at the Beatitudes, this week I want to look at verse 13 through 16 and see uh, this section where he gives us kind of the parameters for what heaven on earth uh, lived out in influence looks like. If you've got your copy of scripture, why don't you uh, follow along with me? In verse 13, this is Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, it's what I, I used last week. In verse 13, Jesus says this, he says, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. For no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, the lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. Everyone in the house. Everyone in the house. And in the same way, he says, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. Jesus is talking about divine influence. He's talking about the way we live. Now, I want to just remind you, he's talking to his disciples. He's got his closest band of brothers gathered around him. But as he's talking with them, there are probably several hundred people standing around the outskirts that are listening in, but they're not a part of the core. But they're listening in. And as Jesus is talking about living for him, they're getting a part of this too. They're starting to be intrigued. They're, they're considering following Jesus. They're new to this thing called kingdom of heaven, uh, heaven on earth, and they're interested, but they're not yet fully engaged. And then kind of behind them is a third wave of people. And these are the movers and shakers of Jesus' day. These are the religious leaders. These are the, the, the Bible defines them by their role. These are the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the, the men who, who typically led in, in ministry in Jesus' day. Uh, in, in this group, there were well-respected people that, that the common crowd, the common community person longed to be. They longed to be just like them. They, they believed in God, and they had lots of rules to define their belief in their walk with, G, with God. Jesus was new on the scene for them, and they weren't sure about him. There was another group called Sadducees. This group as well were, were kind of movers and shakers, but they were, they were kind of of a different bent. 
They, they didn't necessarily proclaim all the thing that, things that the Pharisees did. They believed in God, but they really did not believe in a life after death. Some would say that's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> womp, womp. I tried. All right. So th- there's these leaders, right? These religious leaders. And, and this is the thing. Jesus is moving people towards the things of God. Sure, you're going to talk now about me, right? Jesus is trying to move people towards the things of God. But here's the distinguishing mark. He doesn't move people towards religion. He moves people towards relationship. He's not interested in you looking the part. He's not interested in you acting the part. He's not interested in you having the right verbiage. He's not interested in you, you showing up at a certain time and, and, and doing religious things. He's interested in you connecting your heart to your, to your creator and to know him personally and for that to totally change the way you live every day. He wants your words and your life and your actions and your heart to be in sync. And what was such a, an issue with the religious people of his day is they were good about talking it, but not good about living for God. You know, that's the problem really with religion. Religion burns you out because it makes you fit a mold on the outside, but never deals with the heart. And Jesus here is dealing with the heart. He's saying if your heart is right, then the byproduct of that is you're going to live such a dynamic life that people are going to know that you are different. In fact, your light is going to shine so brightly that darkness is going to be pushed away by it. And there's going to be such a saltiness in a, in a, a good way. That word today means something a little different, doesn't it? There's going to be a saltiness in your life that's going to be such a good thing that it's going to literally bring flavor to those who know you, it's going to bring, bring a, a, a preservation uh, to those who are around you that maybe have yet to come into faith, and it's going to bring a cure to those who are sick spiritually. In all those ways, salt worked during the days of Jesus, and, and he's saying your life is going to function like that, that when there is an integrity on the inside that works its way to the outside, that who he is in you is going to make you influential, divinely influential. And that's really what I want to spend the last few minutes here talking about. Jesus says you can make a difference with your life. And I guess that's really the kind of the heart of this whole thing is you can make a difference. You can make a difference. You don't have to live a life that's just common. You don't have to live a life that just shows up. You can make a difference. Man, isn't that really what we all long for? I mean, one of the greatest drives in humanity is this drive towards significance. Like, I want to make a significant impact. It's really, when it's misrepresented, it's really the thing that drives people to try and make a name for themselves, right? Whether it's a a politician that kind of goes off the the rail and does everything to to kind of establish their own own, uh, fame, or or maybe somebody in, in, uh, in... in Hollywood that, that is, is uh, not seeming to, to make big enough of a splash, so they kind of go off the rail to, to do things, to get attention. The idea that all publicity is good publicity, right? And they, they kind of do something really, really backwards or crazy in order to get attention. They want to make a mark. They want to make a name for themselves. Sometimes it happens in business. Some of you have worked with some people like that. They've not seemed to climb the ladder of success fast enough. So they do whatever they can to get their name known. They'll push others down. They'll destroy relationships. They'll compromise their integrity. They'll they'll make poor decisions with leadership in order to try and gain favor or gain position just to get a, a little higher up the ladder. It's all about significance. But Jesus says... Jesus says that when you live for him, your life doesn't have to be common. You can make a difference. You can make a difference. In fact, if you work on the inside first, then what comes on the outside will always make a difference. Look again at verse 13 and verse 14. It says, in this way, he describes us. You are the salt of the earth. And then he says again in verse 14, you are the light of the world. These two analogies, salt and light, both in Jesus' day made a big difference. They changed the world. They changed the culture. Think about it. In ancient times before, uh, b- before refrigeration, everything they had went bad. There was no way to sustain it. 
They would slaughter a, 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 an animal and, and have all this meat and, and they would cook it immediately. But what wasn't consumed or cooked on that day would go rancid in just a, a, a few short days, maybe short hours. Why? Because of no refrigeration. Unless you had salt. Salt could then be placed un, underneath the meat, the meat placed down, salt placed over top of the meat, kind of covering it. And the salt had a way of, of penetrating the meat and killing off all bacteria. And the meat would be preserved in the salt. And if you grew up in the South, you know a little something about that. All of a sudden, some of you are starting to salivate right now. Like you're getting a little bit hungry. You're getting hungry for some biscuits with some butter. And maybe some apple jam on the side and some fried eggs right over easy because that's the only way that God intends for them to be <laughs> scramble people you're scrambled and and grits and and for all those who are going to watch later online we've got some family and friends around the world that watch and they don't know about grits they are missing out on the gold of the south right but but what does that need it needs one more thing oh man it needs that country ham Right? And everybody said? Amen. You came alive on that one. Seriously. Country ham, right? Country ham, it's been preserved by salt. That salty ham that's sliced thin and then fried up, and every morning brings a smile to your face. Maybe it brings some cholesterol to your body, but it makes a smile come on your face, right? This was the thing that was necessary in the ancient world. If you didn't have salt, then you didn't sustain anything by way of preserving it because everything would go rancid. And Jesus says, in a sense, in a sense, we need to get this. What, what you are is like a refrigerator to the world. He said, you have a way of bringing about a... a preservation to the souls and the lives of those around you. When he describes this as salt, he's saying you make a difference. Listen, it's not just about you. Can I just kind of point that out? You being a, a salt to the earth, salt of the earth and, and light uh, to the darkness, you being these things, Jesus is saying this life that you're living is not about you because salt is not salty for its own sake. It's only a benefit and a blessing when it's applied somewhere else. And light is not good just for itself. In fact, Jesus says it needs to be elevated in the home. It needs to be put up on a, a stand. It needs to be able to, to distribute that light for all because that's when it's most effective. And just like a, a light is only good for others and salt is only good for others, so also your life is to be good for others. Can you say amen? Yeah. Are you with me? In like manner, Jesus says, we are these things. He's pointing out the fact that our lives matter, that people are dependent upon us, upon us making a difference. I think that's really why he follows this whole section about the Beatitudes and, and then moves into this is because he's wanting us to see that we've got to develop what's inside first so that it can make a difference on the outside. You see, blessed are those whose character is right. Blessed are those whose lives are tied into the Heavenly Father. Remember the very first beatitude? Blessed are those who know they have a dependency upon Him. Those who hunger and thirst. Those who, who long for Him. Those who are, are, are relying upon His sustenance. If you don't start with Jesus, everything else is just messed up. And he says it's not about getting the outside looking good. you got to start with Jesus right on the inside. He says, listen, man, woman, student, he says you need to get the inside right so that the outside can, can then have an overflow of goodness to make a difference in people's life. Because if you start with the outside and you skip the inside, it's just a, a, a facade, and I guarantee you, you'll only mess people up. You won't make them better. He says, but you can make a difference. And I get it, because that's the truth. Making a difference is, is, is what it's about. But it can be daunting, can't it? Some people I know have said, no, no, I don't know. I can't deal with, with, with all this. It seems too much for me. Why would God want me? I, I can't speak. I can't, I can't teach. I can't serve. I can't. These things are too big. Like I, I, I do best when I'm just kind of in the crowd, not making a difference. And yet God's called you to step up and step out. 
God's called you to reach out. God's called you to care for others. And I get it. It's a daunting deal. If I'm honest, God has never, never called me to do anything that was equal to my own confidence level. Everything God's ever called me to has always been too big for me. Everything. Everything. I remember when I came to pastor Trinity Fellowship 15 uh, and a half years ago. I remember that very first Sunday. I gathered and we had a, a small core of, of um, precious people. And uh, they were all much older than I was. And um, on that Sunday, um, I was 31 and, and a young buck and first congregation I'd ever pastored. And uh, I'd served on staff and I'd done other things in ministry, but the first church I'd ever been uh, responsible for in this way. And I remember after preaching what I thought was like my best message I could ever come up with, I walked out and, and had to kind of chase people out because that group quickly exited. And I got out to say goodbye and there were two couples that stuck, ar- stuck around a little bit. And as people were walking by when a moment was right, they came up and they greeted me and they said, you're going to do a great job, but we need a more experienced pastor. And I got it. I was like, you probably do. You probably do, if we're just being honest. Because everything God's ever called me to has always been bigger than me. That's what I'm saying. And so for some of you, you're sitting out there, and I've had conversations with many of you, and God has impressed upon you that maybe maybe you need to step up and do something great for the kingdom. Maybe He's calling you to, to go into ministry. Maybe He's calling you to, to be a teacher. Maybe He's calling you to, to, to start some kind of... Um, care ministry or some kind of uh, organization that would change people's lives. Maybe, maybe God's just calling you to step out of your, your comfort zone and to be a part of a small group or to lead a small group or to host a small group. And you're going, I don't know that I can do this. I'm going to just tell you, you can't do it. You can't. You're not good enough. You probably are thinking that. I'm just not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I, I'm not experienced enough. I, I'm not versed enough. I, I'm not... I'm not equipped enough. I'm not, listen, you're not enough. Simply put, you're not enough. Neither am I. I gathered this past week with family and friends of my my dear friend and pastor, Vic Smith. And as we were saying our goodbyes and and, uh, to to him and and, and, uh, sharing stories, uh, it was a remarkable service. But I listened as family member and friend got up one after another and, and shared stories. And here's the remarkable thing. This, okay, this is the pastor to pastors in our district, in our state. He's, he started churches. He's planted churches. He's overseen churches. He's governed in, during some of the, the most difficult seasons and trials. And, and I've, I've sat with him in, in local churches and, and, and had to watch him as he masterfully dealt with crisis and, 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 and cultural shifts and, and challenges and all these things. And I have been amazed by his, his pastoral astuteness. And yet I listened on Tuesday as his family stood and they said, I want to read to you from his journals. In his journal, page after page, I'm not enough. This is too big for me. I can't do it. They said, my daddy never thought he would be anything more than a meat cutter. He was a butcher at, at, at 17 or 18 years old. And he was content to do that for the rest of his life. And yet he great, gained an education and was sent around the world and eventually was pastor over pastors, over churches, over leadership, over ministry. He got it. I'm not enough. And neither are you. And yet God calls us anyway to make a difference because that's what happens. When we get Jesus in here, we begin to affect out here. Can you say amen? Amen. There is a difference that happens when Christ lives in you. It's what Paul would call this mystery of the gospel. So I'd say develop what's inside more than what's outside and trust that God will use you. Tony Campolo once told a story. Some of you know that name about a friend of his who ran into some other friends at, on a midway in a county fair up north one time. And as they did, he looked down at this little girl and she had this, this uh, cone-shaped handle with a gigantic fluff of cotton candy. And it was like this big. It was massive. And she was about this big. She was tiny. And he said, young lady, how are you ever going to eat all that cotton candy? And she looked at him and she said, Sir, I'm a lot bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. 
You know why you can make a difference for the kingdom of God? When you live for Jesus, when you trust in Jesus, when you walk with Christ, when you let the Holy Spirit begin to develop you, when you let the, 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 the things of heaven on the inside of you, listen, it begins to develop and deepen you to where you're bigger on the inside than you are on the outside. And so like David, when you're a ruddy kid taking care of sheep, the Lord can look down from heaven and say, that's my man. Or like for Gideon, he could look down and say, this one who's cowering away in a cave, who's not brave enough to do anything, certainly not lead an army to to battle for, for righteousness, he can say, this is my mighty man of valor. Listen, when when God comes down and he gets on the inside of you, you get bigger on the inside than you are on the outside. And that, that will make a difference. Can you say amen? Second thing I think Jesus is saying, stick together. Stick together. Look again at verse 13. He says, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? The answer is no. He said it'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. The implication has really to do with the concentration level of the salt. This past week, Lori asked me to teach the science lesson to my son, and she, she had to take off to work. And so I sat down with Carson, and we began to read through, and it was all about this very thing. It was about concentration, the, the, the levels of concentration. And the greater they are, the more potent a substance is. And that's really what Jesus is saying here. Uh, scientists will tell you that, uh, that sodium chloride, is, is salt, is one of the, the most stable things on the planet. That quite literally, it doesn't change its properties. So it doesn't dilute itself. Then what's Jesus saying? Well, he's talking to a culture of people that don't have salt as a, a regular staple. They can't go and buy a box of it at, the, at, at Bilo or Publix or, or, or Ingalls. They, they can't do that. So where is it coming from? It's coming from that salt sea, that lowest place really on the planet. They're digging it out where the water has been evaporated and all of the salt and minerals are left and they're digging up this white substance and they're gathering it and they're bringing it back. Only here's the thing. It's not pure. It's not salt. It's salt and minerals and and dust and dirt and everything else. It's white, but that doesn't make it salt. And the more it sits in, their, in their, their, their bowls and sits in their homes, the humidity begins to come in and the waters come in and rain and other things. And, and what's in there that is salt begins to be dissolved and it seeps out. And so what they're left with when it's dry is oftentimes this stuff that looks like salt, but it's not salty. So what would they do? They'd put it on their food or they would, they would use it to try and preserve and it wouldn't work. So what would they do? They'd taste it and they'd say, this is awful. It's not salty anymore. So they'd throw it out, literally throw it out, and it would be trampled on in the road. And Jesus is not saying that salt changes its property. What he's saying really is there needs to be a high concentration if you're going to make a difference. Yeah. And how does that happen? we got to stick together. Listen, one... One can do this, and it's great, but think what two can do together. One can do this, but, but Jesus says that it's important that you not stick alone. In fact, the writer of Hebrews would say, don't give up meeting together like some are in the habit of doing. That's why the body of Christ gathering on, on a day like this is so important. May our large group gathering, our Sunday morning, become all the more increased. I'm going to tell you, I'm already praying about us increasing to the level that next Easter, hopefully next Easter, we can launch a second service. You say, Pastor, I see some chairs. Well, it's summer, so help me fill them, right? People will come back. But listen, I I just believe that, that God wants us to continue to have influence. So we're going to fill this service and we're going to fill the next. And, and, and eventually we'll, we'll erect something that will hold our large group gathering even more. But may we never, never stop dreaming about being together. May we not stop meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But it's not just in the large group setting. It's also in the small group settings that we find intimacy and we find community. That's why we're, we're telling you today that you need to be a part of a small group. Because in this place you can come in and still be alone. But in a small group, even as Pastor Lewis described, that our Horizons group, our our 10 or 12 young adults that are in that group have found out that in those intimate places, you can just be real with each other. And you can know and you can be known. And you can love and be loved. And when you have a hard day, somebody's there with you. 
and you're not alone. Jesus says it's like that. The greater the concentration, the more effective, and the, the greater the difference. The, the Christian faith is not a solo event. It may be personal, but it's not private and should never be solitary. You ought to write that one down. That's tweetable right there, all right? The Christian life is not a solo event. It may be personal. It's never meant to be private. It's never meant to be private and should never be solitary. For if salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing. It's thrown out. It's trampled underfoot. It's trampled underfoot. Jesus says stick together. And there's a lot of scriptures that do. Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise, become wise. You know the implication here? Walk alone, you're probably a fool. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so does one person sharpen another. Proverbs 15, 22, for plans fail for lack of counsel, lack of community, but with many advisors they succeed. He's saying wisdom is found in the counsel of many. The concentration level is greater, the difference far exceeds what you can do alone. The question is, are you alone or are you connected? You want to make a difference? Connect up. Elijah had Elisha, right? David had Jonathan. Paul had Barnabas, right? Peter had Mark. I was thinking about this earlier this week. Do you have a group of friends? Do you have a band of brothers? Do you have someone who stands with you, a a camp of companions to encourage you to keep following Jesus and live for him? If you don't, then you need one. And just as you need somebody to encourage you, you need somebody to encourage you. Every Paul, it's been said, needs a Timothy, right? Somebody we can invest in. And every Paul needs a Barnabas, somebody who can encourage us along the way. Do you have a group like that around you? You need one. Stick together. Make a difference. Lastly, he says, I think, impact your world. Look at verse 16. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. This is what Paul is getting at when he writes in Colossians 4 and verse 5. He says, so live wisely among those who are not believers, those who are not yet believing in Jesus, and make the most of every opportunity. He's saying live wisely and use your moments to point people to Jesus. Let your light shine, right? Be salt, bring flavor to the lives of others, bring vitality to others, bring preservation to others. That's that's the calling that he has upon you. Here's, here's the unique thing about salt. We don't know this in our culture, but, but it's, it's certainly represented in, in biblical times, especially in the Old Testament. Salt, salt was about connection. Salt was about connection. In fact, the, the Arabic word for salt literally means treaty. And the word for treaty, it's the same. It means salt. And the Persian word for traitor or one who would betray another is a word that, that also means saltless. There is this, this community, this connection, this deepness, this, this depth that, that comes when, when we understand what he's calling us to. In the Old Testament, in fact, there's a, there's a whole chapter where, where there's this story told in Second Chronicles about a battle that took place between Israel and Judah. Israel had kind of gone off the rail. They weren't serving God. Judah still was. And Judah had a smaller group, and they only had one of the tribes, and Israel had 11, and and they were the powerhouse compared to, to, to the small group in Judah. And they came down to fight, and they had twice as many warriors. And the kings stood and faced each other, and the king of Judah stops the king of Israel and says, wait a minute, you need to know this. We have the covenant that God made with David upon us. It is a covenant of salt. And you'd say, what's the big deal about that? Because salt represented a connection and a tie that would bind. They would end up rejecting this, this, uh, this conversation and, 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 and come down anyway. And so there are 8,000 marched in on the 4,000 warriors in Judah. And in doing so, God flipped things and there was a, a trumpet that was sounded and, and the, the 8,000 became distracted and they turned and started running back in fear. And when they did, the 4,000 slayed 5,000 of the eight. The whole point was that God was with us because we are in covenant with Him, connection through the salt, the, 
the treaty of salt, the covenant of salt. In the Old Testament, and this continued throughout life even in the New, but in the Old Testament, if you shared salt with somebody at a table, if you shared your salt with somebody, they were forever on your team. They were with you. They were your man. They were like family. We come together, and Pastor Lewis mentioned today that I meet new people in the body of Christ. It's like we're family. Listen, it's because we've shared salt. We've shared this, this intimate reality that, that who we are is all in Him. And this thing that is life-changing and preservation-bearing, this thing has changed our life. That's why you must stay connected. Never, never run from each other. Never, never isolate yourself. Be accountable to one another. Be honest with one another and stay united. Stay united. It's a big deal. And the Bible promotes this idea of being the salt of the earth where we, again, stick, stick together and we make a difference in the impact of our world. Hear me today. If you're a disciple of Jesus, it's not all right for you to live alone and it's not all right... In community, and it's not all right for you to live distant from being passionate for the lost. It's not all right for you to have a private life that nobody ever has engagement with. If you're a follower of Jesus, let your light shine and let that salt begin to change and affect and make a difference in the world you live in. This is a message today for the body of Christ. I encourage you, I implore you, I challenge you to be the salt and light. Would you stand with me? Jack, would you come? Would you just bow your heads with me for a moment? I just want you to reflect on this a little bit here. If, 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 you're, if you're not living a life that is contagious in the, the, the way that it reaches out to others, if you're, if you're only concerned about focusing on your own needs and not really concerned about the world around you, and there's, a, there's something that needs to be fixed inside. And so I'm asking you today, I'm asking you today to allow the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide your thoughts and to change the dynamic in which you live. That this wouldn't just be a life about you, but it would be one where you become salt and light and you, you bring a, a revolution to, to, the, to the world around you. You bring a change. You bring such a, a, a shift that the culture begins to take notice. And the light in you drives out darkness and the salt in you begins to produce such preservation that people come to faith in Jesus. If that's your interest, that's your heart, why don't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just stand as simple men and women before you. God, we're not enough. We're not good enough. We're not smart enough. We don't have enough resources or money. We don't have all of the gifts and we don't have all the experiences. And yet you've called us to make a difference. But Lord, we know that that difference is, is, is magnified. The longer we, we walk together with you and allow our inside to become bigger than our outside. And Lord, so we, we want to, to dedicate our pursuit of becoming more and more followers of Jesus. And Lord, along with that, you want us to make a difference, but, but God, you call us to stick together. So God, may our bonds be, be even tighter, even deeper. Lord, may brothers and sisters begin to, to grow in faith together. And Lord, may you make us as a, a voice, one voice, uh, declaring your greatness to this upstate and this community in which we live. God, may TFC and, and, and our influence become so divinely increased that the world takes notice as we stick together. Lord, may, may our pursuit of you bring about a total change in our world. May it be impacted. And God, may you get the glory for it. Lord, that's just a simple message. And, and we lay these things down at, at your feet. And we say, God, we're not enough, but we're going to be usable. So we surrender ourselves to you. Use us. Would you do that right now? Would you just in your own words just say, God, I surrender to you. Lord, whatever you want for me, whatever your will is, God, whatever the, the direction for my life from here on, I'm going to walk in and I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to, I'm going to be your servant. I'm going to be your leader. I'm going to be your voice, God. I'm going to, I'm going to be your man. I'm going to be your woman for this, this time, God, for this call, whatever it is, I'm going to say yes. And may you use me to make a difference, I pray. Divine influence in Jesus' name.